Dobro jutro, dobar dan. Moje ime je Jan Žorš, Internet Society, dolazim iz Slovenije. And because I see the scared faces of my colleagues, I will switch to English. Um, welcome to this, to this IPv6 panel. And we have two panelists, Jordi Martinez, he is a IPv6 legend. Uh, he's been dealing with IPv6 for how many years? 20? Since 99. Since 99. Okay, then you came in, in the game quite, quite early, as, as I did. And Goran Slavic from, from, from Sox, is local. And I would like to invite, are there any big operators in the room that can say anything about IPv6? So who would like to join us at the panel? We have, we have one, one free seat. Any takers? Velko from Telecom Serbia. Any other people? Come on. Velka, would you like to join us? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Applause yeah. for Telecom Serbia. <laughs> Thank you very much. So today, let's talk about the use cases, about the success stories. And first of all, I would like, I would like to ask, um, well, Jordi prepared some slides. So maybe, maybe you, will, you, you would go through the slides first, and then we continue the discussion. OK? Thank you. Very quickly, because I, I don't want to put the name of any specific customer in the slide, but uh, in the slides, but I, I really want to, to give you some, some uh, let's say, uh, a, starting, a starting line for the discussion. Um, in Europe, there have been uh, a lot of governments, like, for example, Netherlands, Germany, Spain, which taken some, some actions, and I consider that a success story. Uh, for example, in, in, the, in the case of Spain, we have even uh, a law that I actually wrote it, and I remember it was really, really complex because I need to sit down with uh, about eight or nine ministries to, to commonly agree the law, and, and the main point of the law was we need to make sure, that was 2011, we need to make sure that uh, because we are uh, investing uh, tax uh, money, we need to make sure that any acquisitions done by governments, uh, they are IPv6 ready. So when we can turn on uh, IPv6, we don't need to buy again the equipment. Okay? So I think that's, that's a very interesting uh, point. And that happened as well in Latin America mainly. I know in other regions it happened as well, but in Latin America it's one of the regions where I am more active. Uh, I, I, I was contracted by several countries uh, or by several governments, like the ones that I have in this slide. And actually, uh, it's curious because we got a lot of penetration in some of these countries thanks to the government starting to deploy IPv6. So even if the law is only for the public authorities, it already uh, it's going to impact already in the private sector so that's that's one of the the takeaways from that um, looking at uh, the situation in Europe I am not going to mention all the countries but uh, you can see that the, the first one is is Belgium um, and and there are a few others like Germany Switzerland uh, Greece uh, so it's coming uh, in terms of figures, we have almost 60% in Belgium, which is the top one uh, in the world, actually. And, of course, uh, what, what you can see here is that Serbia is not in the picture, okay? So I, I think I started looking at the picture only to, the, to the, the, those countries that have more than 1%, okay? Um, so, yes, clearly in Europe, uh, and it's something I didn't mention before, but the, in the European Commission in 2001, we started a lot of work to promote the IPv6 deployment, and there was a lot of funding for research projects in IPv6, and I think it's clearly visible that it impacted a few countries, not all of them, but uh, at least a few. In uh, America, uh, and here is both South America, Central America, and North America, uh, of course, U.S. is number one, but you can see that there has been a lot of work in uh, many South American countries, and actually they are even uh, over the figures than from, from Canada and very, very close to, to U.S., like countries like Uruguay, um, um, Colombia, uh, Peru, uh, Ecuador. So 
those that I just mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the government took actions in general, also impacted, as I just said, in the private sector. So that's, that's really interesting. In Asia Pacific, we can see the same in, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and recently in India, which deployed a very, very large uh, IPv6 only cellular network. And that's, that's already happening in, in many other countries, right? In Latin America, um, I can tell the history of one specific country, Guatemala. Um, I started doing a consultancy for, for one customer, and Guatemala was, as you can see, in 2016, uh, it was zero traffic, okay? And uh, after we did the consultancy work, it took just 15 days to go from zero to 8%, only in 15 days. And this is only having done the deployment in about 75% of the residential network. In the next few months, we are enable, enabling in the same customer 12 million cellular phones. Okay, so you can guess how the traffic will jump. And this is going to happen also in other countries in Central America where we are working on. So I think all of them are really, really success stories. No need to mention specific companies, but in general, talking about countries or regions, okay? Um, if you compare also the ASs in the world that uh, announce IPv6, uh, there is an interesting situation here is Latin America is in the top place, okay? So as I just mentioned, we have been working with Slacknik for many years. I remember in, I think it was 2005, we did something that we call it IPv6 tour. It was like a rock band moving from country to country and I was visiting every country uh, for three days and doing uh, um, trainings, free trainings for everyone in those countries. So this is the, the, the success story. It took some years. It's not like you do the training and the people get IPv6 deployed on the next day. So you really need to understand that if you want to deploy IPv6, it will take a minimum of three months for a very small network. Typically, it will get to you up to one year to have some level of deployment. So please don't, don't leave it for tomorrow. You should have started two days ago already. And uh, I think it's almost the final slide. Another success story. This is a picture from, from, uh, provided by, by Matt Ford from, from ISOC. Um, this is a measurement. Uh, it's only until August. I didn't ask it him from, from an, an update. Um, it's telling us how successful is the deployment of IPv6 in cellular networks. Uh, so this is the four uh, big cellular networks in US, which is T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, and Sprint. All together in August, we're already surpassing 70% of the traffic. And in my view, they are growing something like about 3% every month. So I guess that in one year from now, there will be probably very, very close to 90% traffic in uh, the cellular networks in US. And from the same website, from the ISOC uh, World IPv6 launch, you can see here the top uh, worldwide uh, 25 uh, providers. So we can see here Comcast, KDDI, Reliance, which is the, the Indian one that I just mentioned. Uh, so you have here most of the uh, North American providers being the top, but also number 13, for example, uh, is Greece. Number 12, uh, I think is UK. Uh, no, UK is number 10, British Sky, and so on. So it's uh, an interesting uh, figure about how much in different regions the penetration is, is going on. And I, I really recommend looking at this website and looking at your own AS, okay? Because that will provide your visibility um, compared to the, to the rest. And, and that's it. That's, that's uh, just to, to set up the scene and, and, and know that it's not something it will happen in a few years. I really believe probably in less than three, four years, most of the traffic in internet will be IPv6. And when I say most, I am not saying 90%, but at least very, very close to 60%. And if you are not within that, uh, f that number, uh, you are a loser, okay? So please uh, really take the steps now, not tomorrow. Thank you.
Thank you, Jordi. So, yeah, thank you for setting the scene. So, when you when you, when you were talking about the cellular networks, I I spoke with Cameron Byrne like a half a year ago, and what you said, seventy percent. Half a year ago, T-Mobile USA had fifty-two million mobile devices on IPv6 only. We are talking about millions of users that are on IPv6 only today. I am just guessing what the number is today, probably close to 80 million, just for T-Mobile USA. Uh, T-Mobile, uh, looking at, if you move to the previous slide, I think uh, they have already 90% penetration. There is a mic there. I'm sorry. Sorry. I think, I don't see it from here, but if you look for T-Mobile, I think it was already 87. 87. Yeah. So I was thinking 90, yeah. it's, it's very close. So and they have right now, I believe, close to 100 million users with IPv6. That's yeah. not a small network. Exactly. And if we count in also other three mobile operators, that's millions and millions of mobile users on IPv6 only. So all of a sudden, all the excuses are vanished. So there are not more excuses not to deploy IPv6 because we can see that there is millions of users on IPv6 and it just works. I, I asked Cameron, what happened to your help desk when you switched millions of users on IPv6? And he said, basically nothing. Nothing happened. He said, there was more wrong number calls to the help desk than IPv6 problems. So basically, more people ordered pizza to the help desk than, than had IPv6 problems. So we are now getting rid of, of, of all possible excuses not to deploy IPv6. But we're in Serbia. Except for pizza. Except for pizza, yeah. We are, we, are, we are now in Serbia. So let's talk about what went, what went wrong here, right? So maybe, maybe Goran, can you, can you please... Um, can we can we discuss what what what's going on in in this country and 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 why why the Serbia is not in in this picture? Well, that is kind of a problem because it, we are not in this picture. But uh, considering what uh, we as a company, as the Internet Exchange, did, uh, we did uh, everything that we were supposed to do. In the 19, 2011, we got the IPv6 allocation. We implemented it in our network, and in 2013, we actually sent a letter to all of our customers, uh, about, in that time, about 30 customers, uh, that they can, we set up the route server, the dual stack route server for IPv6, and we actually sent a letter to everybody who can do IPv6 in order to connect with uh, IPv6 uh, route server, both route servers, and to do IPv6 peering. And uh, about 30 of them actually connected to us, but then it's practically stalled. Those that connected then are connected now, of course. They have active uh, IPv6 sessions, but we didn't have a lot of more takers on that offer. Uh, actually, whenever somebody join, joins uh, Serbian Open Exchange, uh, we immediately allocate him IPv4 and IPv6 address, and we set up IPv4 and IPv6 address on our route servers. So whenever they are ready, whenever they are capable on, uh, or willing, they can, uh, they can simply activate that IPv6 and uh, route it and do the do the connection and exchange prefixes over Serbian Open Exchange. So there, there are options. There are. There is a clear option. Okay. So Velko, thank you for 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 joining this panel. Can you tell us what's going on with IPv6 in in your network? Uh, as far as I know, we have uh, we have it enabled on all our upstream peering links and. On all on all exchanges throughout Europe, you know, all all uh, of our all of our PNIs, and I'm not aware of the situation with with our with some of our upstream providers, but I think that that's working too. 
it's available to our customers, our business customers on demand. So it's up to them to ask. Uh, the situation is as follows. I think that IPv4 address exhaustion has not hit here yet. So that's the main reason that people have been reluctant to en engage into something new. But when that happens, it, w it will be become more, more uh, of an issue. That's about it. Okay, you yeah. you say business customers. What about the residential customers? I'm I'm not aware of the, how the situation is developing on that front. Okay, so I'm traveling around the world and speak to to mm -hmm. big operators around the world, and there is always you know the big operators now realized that users will never ask for IPv6, and that operators needs to if you are acting in a good faith and try to keep your 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 customers, then you need to just give them IPv6, and if they don't even notice, this means you did your job well. I'm, right? I am aware of that. So, <laughs> okay, right. So, what should we do to 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 improve the landscape here in this country or in the region? I think it'll. I think it will happen ev in inevitably. I, I just don't think you can push it. Okay. Maybe Jordi? Jordi was itching. Uh, we, have, we had yesterday uh, a workshop, which, which uh, about, I think it was 30, 35 people. Uh, maybe some of them are, are here in the room. And uh, when we had this, this uh, question yesterday, um, some of the people in the room said, they actually have addresses, but, for example, in the cellular network, they are already using private addresses which carry RayNAT. So that means that you actually don't have addresses. The, the point is that you are doing tricks, and if you want to be honest with your customers, that's not internet connection. That's partial internet connection, because when you use an IPv4 address share it among 30 or 60 customers, you are giving them only a fraction of the internet. It works most of the time, but it breaks many things. And it has also implications on uh, law enforcement. So for example, if you are sharing the address with other 30 people and one of them do a criminal action, the police will need to investigate and that means a privacy implication for 30 people in G instead of just going to find the right one on a first step, okay? So here, from an ISOC perspective, which is also protecting citizens from internet, um, I think we, we, we should understand that not deploying IPv6 already and doing carry RAINAT in addition to an extra cost to your network is also going somehow against doing your work correctly. And most of the people that wait for, well, it will come, it will come, we will do, at the end, they get trapped because it's too late. And one of the considerations is, maybe doing IPv6, you are not going to get new customers, but at least you keep your business running. And that's, I think, what any business at the end needs, right? So that's, that's something that should be considered when you say uh, we have addresses, so we don't need that. As soon as you start, uh, better for making it correctly. So when you, when you, when, when you mentioned the, 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 the law enforcement, um, if we look at this picture here, we see Belgium on the top like with 60%. Lots of people is asking why, why is Belgium so far ahead? I will tell you why. So Europol is organizing the panel discussion about this in, in IGF in Geneva in December and I was honored uh, to be invited as one of the panelists in this discussion. It's about CGN and IPv6. So what happened in Belgium was that ISPs went into a voluntary agreement with the police and Europol that they will not put more than 16 users behind one IP address in their CGN. 
what's currently happening is they do not put more than eight users behind one IP address because um, the police ask them, okay, if one of them um, uh, does the, the criminal activity, then we need just to investigate eight or 16 people and not 20,000 as usual that you can put behind one IP. And ISP said, okay, we will, we will go into this voluntary agreement with you. But then they realized, oh, we're running out of IPv4 addresses. So they just deployed IPv6. And they figured out that everything works, everything is fine. And that's, that's why we have Belgium on the top with 60% of all the traffic from the country coming to Google services is on IPv6. That's a lot of traffic. So that's, that's the reason, yeah, please, Jordi. Let, let me add something else uh, on that. On, uh, on October this year, uh, you were participating remotely, but we had a workshop uh, in Europol offices in The Hague. Um, and that workshop was organized by Europol together with the presidency, the Estonian presidency of the European Commission. Okay? The idea of the workshop was to discuss all this, this topic and the clear conclusion that is right now drafted in the conclusions from the Estonian presidency and, and several documents that, that uh, we have worked about, about that is we really should do a very big push on deploying IPv6 because there have been several criminal cases which let the criminal go because this situation, which is really terrible, okay? Um, so there will be a new recommendation from the European Commission and a strict rules. And one of the things that it's, it's under consideration is if you want to use carrier Raynat, okay, do it. But let's say, for example, for a maximum of two years and in parallel with deploying IPv6. If not, you will be outside of the law. So that's, that's something very, very interesting. It can take some time to, to take that because every country should adopt the same law, but it may happen and it may impact your business as well. Um, the point here is not really, uh, we don't want you to deploy carry Raynat, but if you deploy that, it's because you are actually deploying IPv6. So you really need to take that in, 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 in a, a serious uh, consideration. And one interesting thing that happened in the workshop uh, was, hey, European Commission, hey, police and law enforcement authorities of all around Europe, you are going to give the message that everybody should deploy IPv6. What about you? Have you deployed IPv6? And I ask it to raise the hand what authorities have already deployed IPv6 and only a couple of hands say yes. So that means also there will be a concrete plan for Europol and European uh, authorities to really, really, really seriously deploy IPv6 for them. Because they, they, they cannot say to the countries, let's go to IPv6 if they are not doing so. So if I may just quickly add, there was a, there was a case, and I will, I will not mention any names, when um, one person stole around 10 million euros uh, because he hacked a bank. And the bank provided with the IP address and the time to the operator. And they said, but we have CGN, we have carrier grade NAT. Behind this IP, there was 10,000 people. And they said, well, we don't care. You give us the name or else. And they said, we cannot give you the name because you, do, you didn't log the, 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 the remote port. And then they went to court. And then you go from the engineering understanding of the world, you go to the law understanding of the, of the world with, with lawyers. They understand the world a little bit differently. And they just asked, this IP, on which machine was it configured? And they said, well, it's the CGN machine in our data center. So it's your machine. Yes, you own the machine. Yes, it was configured on the interface on your machine. Yes. OK, so if you cannot tell us who stole our, who stole our money, you will pay us 10 million euros. And they won the case. 
the operator had to pay. Do you want to end up in this situation with lawyers? Probably not. Uh, on the mobile front, as, as far as I know, it's just the situation here, and this is strictly from a user perspective, uh, I think that, I think that the, the operating procedure here for, for quite a while has been, has been not, and, and aside from that, uh, not only not, but proxies. So for quite a while, uh, uh, except for, for users that are strictly on data. But that's, that's just from a user perspective. Perhaps some of my colleagues could elaborate on that if you, yeah. if you can get them to stand up and, and contribute. Yeah. So I don't know how that will develop. They, they complemented that yesterday, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there may be a reason why, 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 we, why we started the internet in end-to-end transparent mode and not with the boxes in between that mask everything. Goran, would you like to add something? Yeah, of course. The uh, problem is that I did sort of an informal inquiry around a couple of uh, those providers or ISPs that are on the uh, Serbian Open Exchange but don't have the IPv6. I just sort of asked them in a very informal setting. That's why no names or companies will be mentioned. Um, and actually, I got a rather uh, strange and diversified uh, answers, like uh, why would we want to implement experimental protocol? Uh, then uh, sort of uh, how much money are we getting by implementing IPv6? I mean, what is, what is going to be to our profit margin? How much money are we going to get after deploying IPv6? Is so that... Uh, financially viable or immediately? Is it financially viable in three months, four months? Yeah, but you're going to get it in the long run. No, no, we're not interested in long run. Right now, how okay. much? We implement Should it tomorrow, we... and then how much is our profit up? Should you ask the room? So who, who in this room is working for the, for the operator? Hands up. Hands up. Operators, hands up. OK. Keep your hand up. Who is not deploying IPv6? They well, are shy. Please, Jordi. Uh, I, I don't know from, wet, from where people got the idea that IPv6 is experimental. Never has been experimental. Never. So really, who answered you that? Um, he or she has a problem. Uh, yeah, but that's a problem. A lot of people are not actively seeking knowledge about IPv6. You know, you have a magazine of about 200 pages, and you read first 50, then there is an IPv6 topic, they just go over it, and then they uh, go, go outside. Uh, one of the problems in Serbia is that uh, IPv4 exhaustion in Serbia is not the actual problem here. Yes, we know that, uh, and uh, actually that should be a big benefit in Serbia because then uh, all, of the, all of the procedures for transfer to IPv6 could be done very, very smoothly with some double stack and then slowly going to over to the IPv6 because you're actually not in a problem and you can actually do something about it. But from managerial starter point, from executives who are actually making decisions, uh, they will uh, most likely tell you, uh, we don't have a problem, why would we solve something that is not a problem for us? Yeah, I, I heard that, that uh, sentence from many operators in many countries in the world, and uh, what- I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> what, what really happens is that the managers don't see that if they want to survive, they need to get ready with IPv6 today. If they start getting ready in two years from now, when they already run out of addresses, they will miss two years in the market, which is, that's the profit you have. It's not the profit, it's keeping your business going on. The biggest, uh, because I was your, on your workshop uh, yesterday, the biggest, uh, I believe, a stick for kicking somebody, manager on the head and telling him to implement IPv6 is the story about Facebook. Because uh, actually data centers of Facebook are uh, completely IPv6. They're only IPv6. Uh, so actually if you go to uh, a Facebook from anywhere in the world, 
if you have IPv6, you're going directly to the Facebook data center. And if you have IPv4, then you need to be transferred to IPv6, either in your carrier network or in a network of Facebook. So actually, you're getting worse service on Facebook if you're going over IPv4. Yeah, just for the people that was not yesterday in the workshop, I had a couple of slides explaining this. Uh, it's not just Facebook. Facebook was the earlier one in 2015, sorry, 2014. Facebook decided to take out all the IPv4 configuration from their data centers. And we are talking about a network that at that time has more than 100 terabits per second. And they are not anymore running IPv4. So what that means is that when you are using IPv4 going to Facebook, you are getting a slower connection. And it's not a slower by 1%, but the, the, the figures that Facebook uh, checked in T-Mobile's network was that IPv6 was getting an HTTP GET response 40% faster, 40 is a lot, than with IPv4. So maybe per se, but user quality of service, not not to say quality of service, which is a different thing, but per se, but user quality of service by 40%, it's something that really impacts, okay? And that means for the operators, for example, in mobile networks, a lot of saving in terms of radio bandwidth, which is expensive, and also battery life and power consumption. So all these things matter because that, something that you can measure in terms of cost for your business. Yeah, and this is not just Facebook. It is basically Google. How about all, Google, yeah. All big content providers are now removing IPv4. And if you as, as an operator did not deploy IPv6 and give it to your end customers, that means that their user experience, Jordan, it's called user experience. Quality of service is something that we don't want to talk about on the internet. Uh, user experience is deteriorating. So Facebook is getting slower and slower and slower, and you have no idea why. Uh, because simply, it's because it's translating on the edge of their, of their data center. The same for Google. It will get worse. If you deploy IPv6, if you give IPv6 to your users, then they will go straight. They will not use the translation. So this is something to consider for. And 40%... I, I worked in internet operations for the, for the ISP for 20 years. I know what that means. People, happy people is people that does not call your help desk, right? And you want your people happy, so please do it. So at this point in time, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Are there any questions, maybe suggestions? Please, uh, we need a microphone. I have questions from the Twitter right now uh, because I'm tweeting about conference and uh, uh, a friend uh, of mine uh, uh, asked me to ask you something. For example, some business users and, uh, want IPv6 and uh, operators telling them that uh, they haven't uh, capabilities, technical capabilities for that. So. For example, till the center from uh, Navisat. They are asking for IPv6 for uh, quite some time, and operator said there is no, there is I, no technical I don't, I don't quite understand this question, because an operator, yeah. usually they are providing the access to the internet. Yes. Internet is today IPv4 and yeah. IPv6. And they are asking for IPv6. For IPv6. Yes. So how can, how can an operator say, we cannot provide the access to the part of the internet? I Jen, no. unfortunately it happens. Yeah. There, there is only one IPv6, I, uh, ISP in this country. Switch to another one. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's, it's, it's market competition. Velko would like to comment. Sure. I've, I've already Microphone. I've already commented to, to the best of my knowledge that, that, it's, that it's available to all our customers on demand. So all, all our business customers. And this is a business customer case as far as I understood. Mm -hmm. yes. So it should be available. 
as far as I know. Did did uh, did your colleague mention who, which which operator he's talking uh, about? It's uh, 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 it's uh, it's not let's important. Do, let's do some name and shame. Come no, on. No, 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 no. Well, they no. they deserve it. No, if they say no, we no, can't no, wipe with no. oh, they no. deserve it. Come on. No. No. All no. Right. Can, can I ask to the floor, there is somebody from the government in the room? No? Because I would like to ask if the government has already considered if they are going to do public acquisition of the new links uh, or services over internet in the next few years. And I don't talk about five years, but maximum one year. So I will say more next few months. Are they going to ask IPv6 support or not yet? If they don't do that, there is something broken here. Yep. Are there any, any other questions from the room? Remarks? People from operators? Please. Craig. Okay, I'm not ISP, but uh, <clears throat> let me imagine this situation. Uh, at ISP networks, uh, home gateways generally does, uh, does not support IPv6. Yes, you, do you hear me? So uh, you should you want to push the ISPs to invest a lot of money to change all home gateways and the concentrators, whatever it is, CMTS, the slums, or whatever, uh, to introduce IPv6. Right now, if you ask them, they will say, I have IPv4, I have enough other space, I am satisfied with that, Practically, all the content on the internet is visible on IPv4. Never mind, it is migrated on IPv6, but it is visible. Uh, my customers uh, are not complaining of the service, of quality of service, user experience, sorry. Uh -huh. So why I need to invest a lot of money to new hardware and to education of my staff to introduce something which will not change anything. My customers will still have the same internet, uh, or the same data, and they will be satisfied. How can you convince the ISPs, forget the law, right now our uh, laws are not pushing IPv6, uh, our government are not pushing IPv6, so how you can convince the ISP that they need to invest a lot of money to introduce IPv6? to the end user, as we heard already, most of them they have in backbone, but they do not have in the access network. So may I, may I share the use case from my country, from Slovenia? Telecom, Slo uh, Telecom Slovenia, it's the incumbent's ISP. They needed two years behind the curtains to implement IPv6 and all their services everywhere, to train the staff and everything, but they still didn't enable IPv6 by default for everyone. Why? Because they decided to implement it gradually. So when you say CPEs, what they do is they, they by default give IPv6 for every new customer that gets the CPE from them. Then they gave IPv6 by default for everyone that there is a lightning strike and they need to replace the CPE. And they provision CPE by default for everyone that makes the change in the self-care portal, if you want to change anything, by default, then it provisions IPv6 for you, and it doesn't matter if your modem CPE supports it or not. There is the option. So the line is going like this, and there is no cost for them, for the CPEs, because they are just, the new CPEs that they are, they are shipping out are IPv6 enabled, and IPv6 capable, and have IPv6 en enabled by default. So there is no, huge amount of money for replacing all the CPEs, but it's a gradual deployment, right? And I believe that every operator could do that, right? Like but to add. it should uh, make strategic decision that exactly. uh, it wants to introduce the IPv6 in the network. I needed from 2008 to the last year, how many years is that, that I was trying to get telecom deploy IPv6? It's a long time. Right, years and years and years of talking to them, persuasion, testing, helping them with all the stuff. But it takes time, but now it's, it's, it's worth it. Right. Responding, responding somehow to your, to your point, um, 
I could agree with what you said for the residential customers, but corporate customers usually don't have low-cost CPs. They usually have a CP uh, that allows support for IPv6 since probably 10 years ago. So if you have uh, a corporate customer, today there is no excuse if you have already IPv6 in your core network, there is no, no excuse to provide them IPv6 service. Now, going back to the CPE problem, I know this problem. I have been working on, on this uh, specific problem since several years ago. And one big mistake that all the ISPs in the world, all of them, did is when they make the tenders for the CPEs, they only realized that they need to support IPv6 maybe four or five years ago. While they should have started asking IPv6 in the CPEs maybe in 2003 or 2004, when it was clearly ready and available. And at that time, there were already many CPEs in the market with the support, but because the ISPs didn't ask it for that, the CP vendors say, why we are going to continue developing more IPv6 features if we don't get the request. Now, what is the situation at this point? Um, there are many vendors that by default, even if you buy the CP in the shop, in the supermarket or whatever, you will get a, a CP with support for IPv6. It's true that sometimes the support for IPv6 is only dual stack, so it don't include the, let's say, latest and more uh, useful transition mechanism that we have today. Like, for example, 464xLAT, which is the one that is being deployed in the cellular networks, okay? So I, I decided to make uh, a review in ITF of the document that is mandating the support of IPv6 uh, in the CPEs, and in parallel to that, and that's an ongoing work, and in parallel to that, in the last APNIC meeting in September in Taichung, Taiwan, I organized a panel with CP vendors. So we had NAC, which is a well-known brand, but not for CPs in Europe. In, in Asia Pacific, is, is very popular also in US. We have Cycel, that for sure you all know, and D-Link, that for sure also you know. It's taped on video. It's available in YouTube, okay? They cannot say now, hey, I was wrong. They said clearly, any CP, even if it's 10 years old, can have firmware to support IPv6. But we are not doing that because the ISPs don't ask for it. So yes. right now, today, in most of the cases, the CP is not really a problem. It's a bad excuse. If you really want to support IPv6 and you have the contacts with your CP vendors, you should ask for them, you should talk with your colleagues and make some push. If you don't provide us the firmware update that we need, we will look for alternatives. I, was, I don't have it today here, but yesterday it was showing a $10, five gigabit ports, dual band radios, uh, CPE using open source, open WRT, and everybody can in most of the cases, use, if the original firmware don't have it, use this kind of open source for doing the upgrade. So I know it's not that easy, but really today, that's starting to be a bad excuse. Yeah. So before sorry, we... sorry to be so harsh, but I really want to, to touch the floor and the reality, not the myths. Yeah. Any other comments? Are there any other questions, comments from the floor before we go to the different topic? One, two, three, off, okay. Right. So let's, let's talk about peering in the region uh, because the network starts at peering, right? And I would like to understand what is the situation, what's the, the parity between IPv4 peering that operators do with each other and with, with, with transits and IPv6 peering. Is there a parity? So what's the pattern that, that you guys here locally see? Maybe, Goran. 
Well, we actually don't see that as a, as a measure. We don't see uh, the actual difference in IPv4 and IPv6. So everybody that peers on IPv4 peers on IPv6? No. But you don't see IPv6 peerings. Okay. So the difference is nearly 100%. <laughs> yeah, you can call it like that. <laughs> All right. Velko, what's your take on that? Uh, I know that, that it's enabled. So okay. we our port on SOX is up on IPv6. It's our, our prefixes are up on their root servers. All our all our uh, PNIs and all our other IXs throughout Europe are, are IPv6 enabled. It's it's advertising prefixes. a hundred percent difference uh, in one part of our peering customers or peering partners we have a hundred percent same v4 v6 but then on the operator side we have mixed uh, mixed how to say uh, feelings of operators some of them uh, deployed v6 some of them not but in general the traffic is very low what I can tell you uh, firsthand is that uh, big CDNs like Google, like Facebook, uh, when V6 peering is down, they, they, they uh, uh, how, how to say, react in a second. Uh, the others, V6 is down and after two days, transferred a lot of a lot of traffic to v6 already well they populate their caches over ipv6 yes so yes exactly yeah, yeah. Yeah. so uh, originally and uh, coming back to this table here i don't think it is 100 uh, percent accurate to be honest uh, because we see we see uh, a lot of uh, v6 uh, peerings not that much v6 traffic but uh, but we see uh, most of the region uh, having v6 enabled from austria from hungary from romania from bulgaria so i'm not sure how how serbia is not here on the on the, the table the table is not measuring uh, is not measuring pitting but actual traffic measured by by google actually i think this measurement is done by apinic by means of google so this is actual traffic percentage we have measurement lab from Google here in SOX, uh, so we could uh, uh, later on we could uh, we could see the actual uh, the actual measurements, mm. and I believe it's better. So are you are you saying that we should start maybe raising awareness first with trying to get people to peer on IPv6 and then continue from there? As Goran pointed out, we did everything uh, we technically could. We even promoted V6, but simply the need is there, uh, isn't there. As Velko uh, pointed out, uh, the request is not there. Okay, we peer, but the traffic is not there. The content is already there on V6, but simply the, the, the demand is not there. Uh, we always, uh, always offer, we always enable on the welcome package that are V6 and V4 uh, peering addresses. Everything is uh, by default V6 and V4. But then again, the traffic is not there. Well, operators in the room, feel free to, to, to comment on, on this and why you're not doing it. But my, my question is how, how should we, you would like to add something? Yeah. Can I take the freedom to set up an action point for all the people here? Tomorrow, 
Don't wait for next week, tomorrow. Get together. Make a claim to the government. They should deploy immediately IPv6 and they should make sure that any public acquisition is supporting IPv6. If you don't do it tomorrow, you will do it never. So don't forget about it. I, I really think, I'm sure here there are operators or other people that has the right contacts in the government to wake up them and tell them this is really important. We should not waste public money in buying things that don't have today IPv6 support. And there is quite a good document. It's called RIPE 554. So 554 is the number that is talking about the procurement and how to ask IPv6 when you're buying ICT equipment. That's the help for your procurement people that have no idea what IPv6 is. They can't even spell it, but it's there. So this, this document is translated into 17 languages and used all around the world. When you're buying new equipment, please use this document for your, for your vendor and ask him, whatever you're selling to me, does this comply with, with, with the RIPE 554 document? But I would like to, to move forward. Let's, okay, we are just discussing this IPv6 thing and how it's big in the world and not big here. But I would like to understand what's the way forward. What should, what should we do to, to, to improve this picture? Any ideas? Because one of the comments was we don't have support in the CPEs, maybe the second action point for the people here in the room yeah. is tomorrow talk with your CP vendors. Mm -hmm. Ask them about this and if necessary, show them the video of their competitors or maybe your CPs are from those brands mm -hmm. that I mentioned before, show them the video. I think if you go to uh, the APNIC blog, you have my article and also the video there, it's easy to find. And it's one hour video, I think it's very interesting because it's actually telling the truth. And if your CP vendor or provider don't uh, agree with what is being said in the video, you should definitively look for an al alternative. Mm. So Goran, what's the plan? Yeah. Uh, I believe the choking point in this, uh, in this instance is the decision makers who actually make the decisions, the technical, because uh, even if the technical staff in some vendor uh, has the ideas, has listened to these presentations, and actually knows about these things, uh, they are going to be hit by an excuse, uh, first of all, financial. Uh, I talked with a couple of people and they say, well, I will do it, but uh, I need a time allocation from my decision makers. They should actually tell me, okay, you should do this two hours a day, three hours a day, uh, and not push that down, push that ball down the street and uh, say, yeah, yeah, we're gonna do it, but uh, these things are more important, these th things are financially more important, and the IPv6 is financially unimportant for us. So, may I, uh, on your point, okay, Very quickly. please. And, and, and just because the decision makers are, are not hearing this, is very important that the government tell them, hey, you are my provider until now. If tomorrow I do a new tender and you don't have IPv6, sorry, you lose your contract. Yeah. That's a way for decision makers to wake up. I recall, I don't remember when it was, but I recall Aiden uh, did, uh, or they sent a letter directly to the CEOs of the bigger companies in North America because that problem. And that wake up a lot of companies to start doing IPv6. So if I may share a short story from, from our, our country. Back in 2008, we started the Go6 Institute. That's a not-for-profit institute to promote IPv6 awareness in Slovenia and wider. And what we did through several of our meetings, we asked basically the government and the regulator to cooperate with us. Of course, first question from the government was how much money you need. And we said, we don't need money from you. We just need your cooperation, right? We just need a representative of the, of the government being at our meetings and, and discuss these things. So how we, how we use this cooperation, good cooperation with the government was, we asked them, 
can you please, at one of our IPv6 um, uh, summits, I would like to ask the government, the ministry, to initiate a panel discussion about IPv6, but and invite the CEOs or CTOs, the high senior management of the ISPs, to talk about how ISPs are deploying IPv6. And they actually, they said, okay, not a problem. And they actually sent uh, official letters with the, with the ministry head and sign of the minister, asking CEOs and CTOs of, of operators to come and sit at the panel and discuss how they are deploying IPv6. What happened at this precise point in time, all these senior management people sort of like, oops, we know nothing about IPv6. We heard about it because technical guys were talking to us, but we were not listening. And what happened, I heard from many people, from technical people, at that days, these senior management people came down to the network, to the knock, saying, oh, I'm invited by the government to talk about IPv6 and I have no idea what is this and what we are, are we working on it? Are we not working on it? Can you please teach me? Can you please give me the information so I would not look very stupid at the panel because it will be a public panel. So we managed to create a link, informational channel between technical people and the senior management people and they learned about IPv6. They came to the panel, it was a great panel by the way and they all of a sudden learned about the importance of IPv6, what's going on in their own company and network. And I heard from many technical people that after this panel, it was much easier to get their, their signs on the, on the bills for the investments for IPv6 or for the time that they spend on IPv6 because we created this awareness shift in their minds. And also we, we, we asked um, the, the regulator uh, they actually sent to all the operators a questionnaire about IPv6. And when the regulator starts asking about IPv6, um, we have this questionnaire, we shared it around the world from, from the, because also other regulators asked for it. It's also translated in English if somebody needs it. When the regulator sends this questionnaire to, to, to the ISP, this comes to a very high level management people and they say, ooh, by law, we are, we must respond. We have no option of not responding. And then they go like, Ooh, we have no answers to these questions. How would we respond? We don't want to look bad in front of, of in front of the regulator. And this also creates the awareness of, um, of, uh, in, in uh, senior management, uh, space. So maybe you could use, you know, we are all in Balkans. Maybe you could use this, this, um, uh, uh, method here to, to start promoting the idea in some senior management people. I believe that's a good idea. Yeah. Would you like to do something like this? Of course I would. Is there somebody from the ministry in the room? Of course. Please talk to people, discuss. Okay. I saw from Megan that we have five minutes. Would we like to discuss anything else or would we like to do the closing remarks because we are standing between people and food? <laughs> we need a microphone in the audience. I thought, I thought somebody was going to say something. Um, one idea, I am, I, I am not sure that this has been done in, in any other country. Uh, the, the cctld.rs uh, maybe could do a workshop about IPv6. That's, that's a possible idea. Maybe it has been done already. And going, going further on that, maybe they want to say, starting on, let's say, 1st of, this, of uh, January, 2018, all the uh, registrations need to have quite a records for the name servers. I don't know if that will work. Actually, I am thinking this is a good idea to discuss with ICANN. Yeah. Maybe it's something that we need to talk about. I, I never thought about that, but why not? 
maybe I can should give to everybody in the world one year from now to say, if you don't have quite a records, you cannot register a name. Okay. I know it's too strict, but maybe we should go that way. Uh, please, cl closing remarks. Boran. Well, I actually believe that uh, in this moment, with all the resources that we have, with all the resources that they are, with the transition protocols like uh, for, for Excel, uh, I believe that uh, the focus should be on um, making decision makers give time to people in technical part to uh, get them acquainted with uh, the plans uh, to get them acquainted with the way to, to transition to IPv6. Uh, and if the persons who are in charge of those things can have just enough time to digest all the things that need to be done, then they can go to decision makers and give them an actionable plan for a transition. And then th that is not going to be a philosophical question, then it's going to be a practical question. We need these endpoint equipment, we need these things in the backbone, uh, we can budget it, uh, we can spread it over time. Um, uh, I believe that uh, the regular day-to-day -day operations in uh, internet, in the ISPs, are taking a lot of time for technical staff to get themselves acquainted with IPv6, and that's the reason why the, the dialogue within the I ISP, I believe, is not going well. I can, I can say the opposite. I never had that problem in SOX. So I know what's, what, what is like on the opposite side of, the, of, the, of that equation when I can get myself acquainted and know about IPv6. That, that's, uh, that's a different thing Okay. for Any me. Any other final comments? No? Nope. Any final comments from the floor? Please, Krajko. Okay, uh, I don't like your idea about CCTLD. Why? Uh, if you introduce that, that request, the domains will migrate to GTLDs. So CCTLDs, first of all, GTLDs should ask that. And after that, you can push on CCTLDs. I, I, I was actually thinking in doing in all the TLDs, not just CCTLDs. All of them at the same first time. First of all, GTLDs, and, and after that, you can uh, ask that from CC, uh, CCTLDs. Uh, regarding the IPv6, uh, maybe mobile operators are the winning combination because uh, terminals are already IPv6 capable. So they only need to uh, activate IPv6 in their own networks. And with, this, with that step, they will introduce new quality of experience for the users, which will mean uh, will be plus for them on the market and they collect new customers. So maybe we should push the mobile operators to introduce IPv6 for the end users, and after that also push the gov government with the uh, laws and their request to uh, ask for IPv6 yeah. uh, support and network. Well, basically for the, cell for the mobile networks, it's quite easy. We introduced in Slovenia IPv6 in three mobile networks in 2010, and for the last seven years I'm running around the world with IPv6 only connectivity on my phone and you know, it's, it's quite easy. For first two years, I, I even had the free, um, free data because nobody was able to actually process the, the, the charging uh, ticket that was produced by, by the, the system. But now they fixed it, so I don't have free internet anymore. <laughs> we should put at least one operator. The others exactly. will follow the first exactly. one. Well, we have millions of users on IPv6 only already, so it shouldn't be that hard, right? Okay, um, I would like to thank the panelists and maybe, maybe at, at the next RSNOG meeting, maybe we will have an IPv6 panel with the senior management sitting here and wondering uh, what kind of questions we will ask them. And they will have to learn at this point in time if you decide to do that. But thank you very much for listening and I believe it's lunchtime, right? Okay, Megan will explain, it's, it's rather complex probably. Thank you. Ručak još nije spreman, tako da ćete morati još malo da sačekaj.
I promise to make it short since it, uh, it is lunchtime. Um, so first, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to our speakers and to thank you for coming. So I, I hope you found this morning um, interesting and useful and you will go back to your networks and deploy all of these excellent things. Um, just a, a couple quick recaps from this morning. We do have a local chapter here. You can join the Internet Society as a, a global member and you can also join the local chapter and get involved in the local work that you're doing. There are two URLs on the bottom of the screen here. Um, and then get involved in Deploy360. So please go to our website, take a look around, um, let us know if you have everything that you need and if you don't contact us, we're, we're here to help. Um, we've been pretty active on Twitter in particular today, but um, thank you to the few of you who have been tweeting along with us. Um, you can go recap everything. All of the presentations are online now, so if you wanna take these presentations and send them to your managers and, and say this is why we need to do IPv6, for example, um, everything is online. If you, if you just go to our website and type in Ion Belgrade, you should, you should find it, um, but here's the direct URL. So that is it, lunch is up right now. I think they're kind of putting it out right now, but I think it's ready. And um, RSNOG will begin at 1.30, so we have about an hour for lunch. Thank you for coming. <laughs>